Several times I've talked about future knowledge affecting our perception of the past. People forget that in 1999 there were no vulture droids. For anything you don't personally remember, we need to look up documents from that era. On this channel, we tend to use various reference books. Tabletop RPGs also have a lot of useful lore in them. In this video, we will examine a game from the turn of the millennium. Its name is Battle for Naboo. If you've seen a few of our videos and feel like we've earned your support, please take time to check that you're still subscribed to the channel. Leave a like, perhaps. Fiddle with the notification bell so you're notified as soon as we upload new videos. Why not join us on Discord? We promise it's only half as bad as that sounds. <laughs> it is too bad. <laughs> if you'd like to support us financially, consider becoming a patron or clicking join under this video. YouTube members get access to Imperial Rank Insignia in the comments section. Computer games are known for having certain lore inaccuracies. Some aspects have to be completely disregarded as non-canon. How many times did Darth Revan break into someone's house? On the whole, most Star Wars games are intended to be plausible. The aim is to create a background character from the movies. Someone else who lived in the same galaxy as Skywalker. There will be a substantial reward for the one who finds the Millennium Falcon. In this case, we need to pilot Gavin Sykes. Make contact, Sykes. Then lend a hand. We're on our way. Don't get in any trouble until we show up. This is a vehicle combat game. There's no button to get out and walk. If you look carefully, pilots are made of crossed cardboard cutouts. We most commonly associate that technique with trees. As with many games, there is an opening crawl. The wording starts off similar to The Phantom Menace. This version has no mention of the Jedi and not much on the Republic. This game is entirely about the Naboo invasion and its resistance. Where the movie skips over, this game's campaign tells that story. The Trade Federation has invaded Theed and you must escape. You are ordered to aid your fellow officers as necessary and follow Captain Kale's commands. The first mission is highly linear. The entire map is within the city, so you're constantly hemmed in by walls. For an opening level, this is a sensible choice. Several enemies are shown, but they're split up between corridors. The streets are just wide enough to turn around, but it should be difficult to get lost. This level is also a perfect test of your control mapping. I haven't found a viable way to make it work using the mouse. Using a controller seems by far the easiest solution. Starting this level in a flash speeder also makes sense. It's one of the simplest and most common vehicles on Naboo. During the invasion, police and guards could easily be driving a flash. It serves as a baseline so that later ones can be a noticeable upgrade. This is Captain Panaka. I am ordering all officers to clear the city at once. The mission starts with Captain Panaka ordering a peaceful evacuation. Gavin follows a twisty route out of the city, meeting up with others along the way. Battle droids are trivial opponents, where destroyers are a moderate threat. Tanks are the largest threat, and very limited in number. One of the main game features is the use of multiple vehicles. Each level starts with a vehicle selection menu, even if there are no alternatives. The AAT serves as the Trade Federation's frontline assault vehicle. Designed to wipe out enemy troops, the AAT boasts a powerful laser cannon capable of punching through enemy ranks. A fearsome sight on any battlefield, the AAT is one of the Trade Federation's most formidable weapons. That's controlled by the game's unlockable system. Experienced players can replay a level to see which vehicle is best. Depending on the mission, you may be able to change vehicle in the middle of a level. Head for the hangar. Sometimes this happens as part of the story. Fast, 
agile, and moderately armed. The Flash Speeder functions as the RSF's primary ground patrol vehicle. The first moments of gameplay happen in a Flash Speeder. It makes sense as a starting vehicle. Its only real focus is speed. Theed Security would use these as flying police cars. The Pursuit Blaster would be an ordinary sight, not alarming to the citizens. As we mentioned earlier, Flash Speeders are substantially modified. Their original form, the Sorosub Seraph, was a civilian speeder. Naboo added a single Pursuit Slash Defense Blaster. Was that all Panaka had installed? The game suggests otherwise. There are multiple differences. Most visually apparent are an extra set of vents underneath the spoiler. They aren't present on the original model from the movie. That isn't a big deal, they do make the design look more interesting. Despite the visible exhaust, it seems they aren't meant to be jet thrust nozzles. More likely to be cooling vents for the repulsor lift power generators. The original design had a notable lack of ventilation surfaces. This game's depiction is inaccurate, and for once that's an improvement. The other notable deviation relates to weaponry. In the movie, only a single blaster cannon is shown. Every reference book mentions that flash speeders have only a blaster. For the sake of gameplay, Battle for Naboo adds an entirely new weapon system. A missile launcher with a small magazine. Every vehicle has one blaster weapon with infinite ammunition. The game needed a torpedo button which has to work on all vehicles. Flash speeders were given a missile launcher because it's the least bad option. Where is the launch tube though? The game model has a small lump on the front underside where the N1's launcher is. That seems more likely than a blaster with an added missile launcher. The game isn't the first to add missiles that hadn't been there. It happened during the attack on the second Death Star. Wedge flies an X-Wing, so he fires a pair of proton torpedoes. Lando is right behind him in the Falcon, which has no torpedoes. As far as I can tell, this is when concussion missiles were invented. The Falcon fires two from launch tubes between the mandibles. Concussion missiles have also appeared on the A-Wing and Z-95. Though they are effective, we think of concussion missiles as inferior. Proton torpedoes are more devastating against armored targets. The heavy stab supports laser cannons and powerful missiles. The lightly armored vehicle is typically used to explore dangerous areas or mop up retreating enemy forces. After the flash, the campaign gives you a new speeder. These are called the Heavy STAP and their design lineage is obvious. They're derived from the single trooper aerial platform. Both types of vehicle are effectively just variations on the speeder bike. The stap is just laid out differently, to the point it's completely lacking a seat. Comfort isn't an issue for battle droids, so the vehicle was designed without regard for it. More than anything, it reminds me of the old plasma beam drill platform. A heavy stap is quite different. It retains the vertical part, but adds a heavy rear section. Part of this included a chair. Luxury. Wow! The model doesn't have the drive turbine exhaust next to your legs either. The added machinery will include repulsor lifts to support its new weight. Engines will also have been upgraded, though not by much. The heavy stap will have a worse power to weight ratio and lower top speed. With its extended length, this version can have longer cannon barrels. Like the Flash Speeder, the game gives the H-Stap a missile launcher. The game treats all vehicles as if they have shields, including the heavy stap. While not impossible, we normally only see shields on various types of spaceship. Though they appear as a playable vehicle for Naboo, that's only by capturing. At the end of the first mission, our heroes steal a couple of parked ones. Let's take those heavy staps. I'm not sure the heavy stap needed to exist, but I like the design. It's the only option for a vehicle smaller than an AAT tank. There is some basis for this in concept art. An early version of the stap was sized more like the snow speeders. That one even seems to have a missile launcher front and center. Other concepts were more like a speeder bike with no enclosed cockpit. The Trade Federation has taken control of the planet and only the swamps appear safe. Follow Captain Kale through the Naboo farmlands until you reach the swamps. Our next mission takes place shortly after leaving the city. Still riding the heavy stap, Gavin and Kale respond to a droid presence. We can assume Theed was the first major city to fall. On the plains outside the capital, the outlying farms are under attack. Oh! Oh! We're under attack! 
there are many battle droids riding the ordinary stap. More enemy types will appear later on, after the player gets some practice at aiming. This level exists as a shooting gallery, and STAP has a very narrow target profile. Hitting a single trooper is the hardest shot you'll ever need to make. By completing the level, the player has figured out how to aim. The controls take some getting used to, though I wouldn't say they feel bad. Unlike the linear city, this is wide open terrain. The player gets used to the minimap, chasing red dots. There's also an orange sector as your objective marker. After protecting a few houses from stab troopers, stronger enemies start to appear. We've encountered heavy resistance. Like there's a traitor village in the swamp. They'll help us once we find them. Two droid starfighters fly overhead, though they're not aggressive yet. The player is nudged to aim upward while using a land speeder. That will be important in a few specific moments. The AAT was introduced in the first mission, they're no surprise. Most opponents are only dangerous from the front. Tanks are sluggish, they're often the best place to fire your concussion missiles. Halfway through the level, we see something set up at the end of mission 1. There is a hangar with the strong suggestion that you enter it. When you see one of these, it represents a chance to swap vehicle. Since the heavy stap is one of the worst available, it would be smart to accept. This marks the first use of the police cruiser, our training air vehicle. Land speeders hover just above the ground, from dozens of meters to less than one. This is particularly significant because it marks an entirely new type of gameplay. A trader village is hidden deep in the heart of the swamp. Locate the village before it can be destroyed. The traders may provide valuable information and allies to the resistance. Mission 3 takes us into another new environment. We're looking for a small village in Amaresia. That takes Gavin beyond the farmland into a swamp region. These aren't a forest or jungle. All the trees are spaced out. They look rather like willow trees or the local equivalent. We don't know if Naboo's colonists brought space gorse with them. The entire location is covered in a mild storm. I really like this level, it has a great atmosphere. You can almost smell the air, just the right amount of rotting wood. The Naboo Bayou introduces us to several new vehicles. Two of these are boats, actual displacement and buoyancy boats. Cover those houseboats. They make perfect sense even in Star Wars, we'd expect them to exist by now. The closest thing off the top of my head is the Amphibion. Even that isn't a real boat, it's an ordinary hovercraft. They use an air cushion instead of anti-gravity repulsors. A conventional boat is most practical for long-term residents. Ships are designed differently for various earth conditions. What if the sea isn't ordinary water? Luckily, both boats in this game are designed for Naboo. Trade Federation gunboats are a very minor part of this level. Far more interesting are the local village traders. The swamp dwellers use stonewheeler houseboats. There's nothing wrong with that decision, it looks very cool. With sufficient power, the efficiency of your paddle steamer isn't a big deal. The size seems to be about 50 meters long. They aren't optimized for cargo, but could stow a lot of small crates. The other new vehicle is a bomber variant of the droid Starfighter. Where the standard model has four knife-like wings, the bomber has two large pods. Each one is several times the size of the lump where the droid brain lives. Bombers are armed with blasters as well as some kind of energy bomb launcher. Nothing here sounds unexpected. Just as the Empire has Thai bombers, the Federation could do with some more specialists. After taking out a pair of gunboats, the remaining mission is all dogfighting. For the civilians, the bombers are by far the greatest threat. As Gavin is flying a police cruiser, fighters are more of a danger. Captain, droid starfighters are in the area! When we aren't at risk, we would prefer to focus on the bombers. Droid starfighters will fly in to attack the escaping boats. The boatmen clearly have comms equipment because their leader gets in contact. This is Rogue 2. Good morning. I see you guys to drop by. He provides the next mission objective, to rescue an isolated villager. Captain, one of my best men, Ben Dennis, is trapped at the far end of the village. Rescue him, and I'll give whatever aid I can. Follow me, Lieutenant, that's a direct order. The Resistance needs skills and able bodies, so that's perfect. A cutscene showed the location, a house on an island in the swamp. You will notice a police cruiser parked right outside at the top of the hill. Protecting this place seems like a very sensible idea. 
Gavin shoots down a few squadrons of droids, which is a simple matter. Once the traders are safe, everything goes better than planned. The villagers do have useful information, a lead regarding a smuggler in the mountains. That blue aircraft is also relevant. You gain a new recruit. A reasonably convincing human runs out of his house and climbs into the cockpit. Now, how can we help you? We're looking for able pilots and soldiers to fight the Trade Federation. We're just simple traders, but I've heard rumors about a smuggler in the mountains north of here. Maybe he can provide some assistance. Excellent. Can you give me the coordinates? I'll do better than that. I'm sending Ned with you. He'll show you the way. Enter the mountains in search of the mysterious smuggler, who could become a powerful ally in the fight against the Trade Federation. Having gained some information, the Naboo forces have a plan. Sir, we're closing in on our smuggler friend. I doubt he'll be happy to see us. The smuggler has just been located, so our heroes move in. Just as the RSF reach the ship, a formation of droid fighters intercept them. Gavin doesn't do well, he's immediately shot down. Rather than try to keep flying a ship in flames, he makes for the nearest hangar. This is where you change vehicle into a flash speeder, assuming you selected that in the menu. As you complete more levels, alternatives will become available. The first half of this mission is mostly helping civilians, if that's what you decide. There are a lot of opportunities in this game to defend the innocent. Given the emphasis on replay value, you will do that, some of the time. Other times you play, it may be speed you focus on, perhaps destruction or accuracy. The game features a medal system, rewarding players for doing well in every aspect at the same time. Officially, your mission does include protecting citizens. That isn't always the correct decision. At the first homestead, a series of stamp troopers are already attacking. Lieutenant Sykes is ordered to protect the house. There's a homestead under attack. Stop the battle droids, but make it quick. As you finish fighting, a civilian land speeder will pass by. By defeating the droids, the driver will offer you access to a special upgrade. You're done for, bull brain. Great work, officer. Follow me. I have something to show you. There are a few of these in the game, and this one increases your missile damage. Immediately after being rewarded for protecting people, the mission shows the opposite. Gavin reports the same situation again, but is ordered not to intervene. Captain, requesting permission to rescue those civilians. You can't fight them all. Move on. There is no reward for rescuing these citizens. It's just a waste of time. You must push forward to reach your mission objective. That turns out to be just around the corner, past the cutscene trigger. We see a potato-shaped cargo vessel, the rumored smuggler. The ship is under heavy bombardment from an AAT. I spotted a cargo vessel. It's under attack. Our hero reports in to his commanding officer and is told to announce himself first. By hailing the ship before intervening, their bargaining position is more favorable. What's this look like? We're pinned down! We've lost our main engines and our repulsors are failing! All power has been routed to the deflector shield! The smuggler ship explains how bad the situation is. Volleys from a tank cannon are a serious threat to starships of that size. We have no choice, General Calrissian. Our cruisers can't repel firepower of that magnitude. Gavin makes sure to claim credit for the help he's about to offer. I'll lend a hand. This is a perfect opportunity to use the missile launcher on the game's flash. One or two missiles per AAT is the optimal usage. That still won't destroy most tanks, but your blaster cannon can finish the remaining health. Overusing missiles is wasteful, since they aren't replenished during battle. This sets up the gameplay loop for the rest of the mission. The smuggler will fly low, staying inside valleys to keep out of sight. Gavin will follow along the high ground in his land speeder. Many stab troopers will pass through, but they are mostly insignificant. There are two real obstacles to this mission. The main one is the tanks, which take up position to hammer the smuggler's ship. If it takes too much damage, the ship will be destroyed and the level ends. More dangerous to Gavin, there are cliff edges everywhere. Anytime a land vehicle falls a certain height, it's instantly destroyed. It gets irksome when you would have landed safely on valid terrain. This combines with the driving controls, an unreliable brake in particular. Once you get the hang of driving, the mission is very simple to complete. The smuggler Gavin located is grateful for the way you saved his life. He introduces himself as Borvo the Hutt. The Honorable Borvo the Hutt would like to thank you for all your help, Lieutenant Sykes. You're welcome, Borvo. Borvo offers our aid as a sign of his gratitude. Borvo hopes that you enjoy a cold climate, Sykes. 
Now that Borvo the Hutt has joined the resistance, you must protect his vessel until he reaches his hidden outpost. Once at the base, Borvo's own pilots will join the fight against the Trade Federation. This is one of the more exciting missions of the campaign. At this point, you've only flown the police cruiser, and you have two speeders to drive, the Flash and the Heavy Stap. These are not particularly good vessels, so the upgrades are significant. The mission starts aboard a Flash speeder, running along a valley between mountains. The Hutt has agreed to help the Dabu resistance if you defend his ship. When you've turned the first corner, a security hangar is waiting. This could be ignored if you wanted to keep driving a land speeder. That's an entirely viable way to play the mission, though only a few are like that. If you go into the hangar, you can play through using an aircraft instead. Either way, the other type of vehicle will appear to provide air or ground support. As he travels through the mountains, eventually Gavin discovers a hidden outpost. Don't worry, we're almost home. This seems to be the location Borvo calls home, with many of his minions. However, the Trade Federation got here first. Thanks. Pick your targets and go. The area is full of AATs, plus the occasional droid starfighter. After destroying the nearby tanks, we're presented with an unfamiliar type of starfighter. It called for reinforcements. We'll need to make a quick exit. Keep clearing a path to the factory. Yes, sir. They are hut fighters, manned by Borvo's men. Federation reinforcements are on the way, so Gavin keeps moving. In the next valley over, the Feds have taken control of a factory. I have the factory in sight. Good, let's wipe out any trade Federation forces quickly. This turns out to be a Naboo facility, nothing to do with the hut outpost. Clearing out the place is simple, so long as you don't shoot any of your own buildings. Securing the N1 assembly site is a major victory. Without needing to raid the royal hangar, the resistance gains access to N1s. The N1 assembly site is now under our control. Now we can start giving the Trade Federation some real trouble. Borvo and Captain Kale plan to assault a Trade Federation base on Naboo. However, before the attack can take place, you must disable the communications web controlling the target base. Pinpoint and destroy the central comm satellite to disable the web. After liberating a wing of N1 starfighters, a new mission type becomes available. Mission 6 is the first one to take place in orbit. The Naboo resistance has identified a weakness in the Federation control signal. While they can't expect to fight a Luka Hulk, other infrastructure is available. A control node in space above Naboo, designed to relay the signal across the globe. Now, wait a minute. I think you're all overlooking one important point. Those TV casts are coming from an unauthorized satellite, a pirate. The satellite has a visible bubble shield, which is very surprising. When we see shields like that, we normally call it an atmospheric interaction. In order to bypass a shield like this, Gavin scans for a shield projector. Nice work. The shields on the comsat have weakened. Now we know how to destroy its defenses. Find the rest of the slave satellites and destroy them. These are much smaller satellites, deployed near the main control node. Each of these is a vulnerability, though even one projector can create a useful shield. That's two satellites down! The game makes this arena a little confusing. It's hard to tell what shape the space is. Shield projectors are hidden beyond visual range. You have to follow a 2D arrow to navigate a 3D space, making this even harder. That's the last one, sir! The shield has dropped, the contact is vulnerable. With all three projectors disabled, the shield on the main relay is down. The mission is mostly complete now, the only complication being a few missiles. Six turrets on the control node itself, a moderate threat. Far less of an issue than the droid starfighters guarding the projectors earlier. Good work, people. We just put a Trade Federation base to sleep. We need to act fast. It won't be long before they replace this compact. We're on our way. The comm satellite has been destroyed, temporarily disabling at least one Trade Federation base. Attack the sleeping base. Destroy all Trade Federation weapons and capture a gunboat for the resistance. The next mission sees Gavin fly the same N1 down to the surface. He has a limited window of time to complete this plan. It looks like we'll be another two hours before we're back in business. The N1 squadron flies through a glacial environment, closing in on the Federation base. This region features a lot of platforms and water up on stilt legs. Sometimes there are buildings on top, though the first few are for turrets. 
Thanks to the previous mission, these first few turrets are completely inactive. Destroy anything and everything that belongs to the Trade Federation. Before the pilots have a chance to leave the first ravine, the defenses come back up. Attack are active! We're surrounded! Give us some cover! There are a considerable number of hover mines in this mission. Trade Federation gunboats also appear, though not in significant numbers. Turrets and droid fighters are by far the most threatening opponents. Eventually, Gavin finds their destination. There is a Federation hangar in this part of the world, responsible for launching gunboats. Black ship just been drafted into the Trade Federation. Enter that hangar and grab one of the Trade Federation gunboats. We have to assume this is a supply depot and dry dock. These boats wouldn't be manufactured on Naboo and may have been dropped elsewhere. The hangar is a useful example for future missions. The only real threat are the turrets, so they have to be first priority. They may try ground to air missiles. And that's just what they're doing, Sam. There's a shield around the hangar itself, so you're reminded of the previous mission. We know the shield will depend on some nearby machinery, just like in space. In this case, what looks like a large white water tank. With the hangar exposed, Gavin is free to land and steal a boat. I've secured the gunboat, but it handles like a wounded bomba. Well, you better get it under control. We're sending you up river. The fighter pilots destroy a barrier in the river, allowing this boat to pass through. It would be wise to sweep for mines before leaving. We have visitors. Keep going. The Trade Federation will think you're a Nemoidian escaping. They shouldn't follow. We'll rendezvous later. The Trade Federation gunboat has been designed to explore and conquer the dense swamps of Naboo. The vehicle's powerful engines propel it through the dangerous waterways, while the twin laser cannons and rotating turret destroy any opposition. The boat's thick armor protects it from underwater obstacles and enemy fire. The next vessel is one of the most rare categories in Star Wars, the Trade Federation gunboat. Across nearly every sci-fi universe, ship is short for spaceship. When boat is used, it tends to be very casual slang. Boat may also refer to any shuttlecraft aboard. If you need to cross a body of water, any repulsor craft will do. Speeder bikes and land speeders can float above water as easily as any other surface. The heavy sap was noted for struggling to cross rivers. Why, you bojo? <laughs> the boats don't work on water! Air speeders are unaffected by most terrain, being essentially aeroplanes. As the Trade Federation don't seem to have air speeders, water is their weakness. That's a bad idea when you're trying to invade a planet like Naboo. The gunboat was their solution, specifically created for Naboo. It makes sense for there to be several unseen Trade Federation craft. These don't seem to function as submarines, which is an odd oversight. Naboo is unique in the galaxy for its network of underground rivers. For the Federation to ignore this, it reveals their priorities. If they knew about Gungans, they didn't consider them to be worth redesigning the boat. Besides, the Naboo also lack widespread submariners. It's clear nobody expects to do much fighting underwater. The gunboat's overall shape is similar to that of the AAT. Its bow is shovel-faced, a wide section that lines up with the tank's foot. Though it may include some repulsor lift systems, we expect this to be a mundane boat. Created for use on Naboo, it displaces enough water to stay buoyant. When at full throttle, we see a wake suggesting there are drives in the bow. Each side has what appear to be ducted propellers with intakes on the bottom semicircle. We could also interpret the leading edges as having slats, another set of water intakes. The gunboat appears to have significant armor, despite how little hull there is below the waterline. In terms of guns, the gunboat has only two weapon systems. Right at the highest point of the vehicle, in the stern, is a laser turret. This is where we'd expect it to be, if we assume the gunboat is AAT-based. The boat has a twin-linked heavy laser cannon. It's hard to estimate the relative power, similar to Vulture or AAT cannons, perhaps more like the MTT blaster cannons, a lower yield. The secondary weapon is mounted on the forward section, with a single turret of its own. This behaves more like a mortar than a missile launcher. The trajectory follows a severe arc, demanding its own reticule style. In gameplay, it needs a mode switch before use. Normally, firing torpedoes sends them directly to the same place the blasters are aimed. Given the mortar shells have such a different flight path, you would miss every shot. Instead, pressing the secondary fire switches mode. Hitting the torpedo button a second time is what launches the projectile. 
The laser cannons have a similar behavior, though with different usage. When you hold down the brake, Federation gunboats stop moving and switch to the turret. Its hull continues to face forward, but the turret can be aimed freely. As far as we can see, the cockpit of the gunboat is just forward of the lasers. There's no transparent windscreen, which is fairly common for the Trade Federation. Despite how unexpected this vessel was, I really like it. The design fits the faction, draws on their other vehicle shapes, and seems practical. Lore on this design is sparse and inconsistent. An encyclopedia from 2008 names it Ostracoda Gunboat. That entry also claims the gunboat is submersible. Meanwhile, a 2002 comic depicts the gunboats hovering decimeters above sea level. I approve of both as secondary features. By adding repulsors, portage is trivial for the gunboats. If you're building a semi-submerged vessel, you're already halfway to a U-boat. Might as well seal the hatches and let it dive. One secret vehicle is named the Swamp Speeder. In terms of hull shape, the design is most similar to a Giant. Weaponry also matches the Giant. Light and heavy blasters. The hull is green like a flash, but that's irrelevant. Swamp Speeders have a single large engine at the back. Everything about this appears to be an ordinary land speeder. However, the Swamp Speeder can only be used on water. That makes it very limited in application, only valid in a few missions. Unlike the TF gunboat, this speeder wouldn't work on buoyancy. It really is what it looks like, a repulsor craft for the water. It's hard to say which aquatic craft has the better design. Assuming they function equally well, anti-gravity is probably a tempting option. Hydrofoils exist to reduce the amount of hull in contact with the water. By floating above instead of sitting through the surface, there's no drag. Air resistance will be far less of a concern than hydrodynamic drag, I suspect. The Trade Federation has established labor camps on the banks of the Nabu River. Liberate these camps and defeat the Nemordian slave drivers. Though there was a brief playable section earlier, this mission shows off the gunboat. It takes place at night, away from the glacier environment. Similar to the early swamp, this level has a great atmosphere. You'll discover proximity mines take two laser bolts to destroy. In the course of avoiding mines or turrets, the player is likely to discover the turret function. There is also an enemy bomber, a trap. A couple of minutes down the river, Gavin picks up an incoming droid starfighter. A bomber variant specifically, so probably more dangerous to the gunboat. The lieutenant reports this in a panic, demanding the N1s back him up. A Trade Federation patrol! I need backup! Lieutenant Sykes, calm down! Don't do anything stupid! I copy, sir. Captain Kale reiterates a bit of advice from the end of the last mission. By using a gunboat, Gavin appears to be a fleeing Nemoidian. They are expected to be cowards, but a gunboat seems an odd getaway vehicle. Kale doesn't give exact instructions, he just says to be careful. So long as you don't fire at the bomber, it won't notice anything out of place. Captain Kale, I found a mining camp. The Trade Federation is using captured Naboo as slaves. Do as much damage as you can and free the prisoners. We proceed down the river to a mining camp, our goal for the entire mission. We're here to rescue prisoners from the camps, preferably gaining a few pilots or soldiers. The approach is a little more complex than just shooting turrets. There are two shield generators powering the camp's energy fences. Taking those out ends this part of the mission. This is Sykes. I freed the camp. But there are a lot of civilians that still need rides out of here. The Naboo prisoners have been freed from their slavery in the camp. This is the perfect time for our new ally to show his usefulness. Borvo the Hut has several cargo vessels standing by. Three smuggling ships descend into the shattered work camp. Between them, the Hut transports easily have enough room for everyone. This mission gives another opportunity for stealth, intercepting a Fed sentry. A Trade Federation sentry! He'll warn the camp. If you can destroy the gunboat before it reaches the next camp, all turrets will start in passive mode. Gavin has been assigned air support, but the approach is too dangerous. Missile turrets would completely prevent anyone from operating in this area. 
When you finally disable the last launcher turret, your air support arrives. Beginning my attack run. There was a shield generator out of your reach. Only from the air would there be line of sight. With this camp also liberated, there are a few more prisoners. This time, the hut ships are not available for the evacuation. There are several of the Sternwheeler paddle steamers, which will work flawlessly as transport. Transport should be on the way. Not quite, Gavin. I just received a message from Adela. The hut can't spare another transport. Okay, I'll get this convoy to the ruins. Let's move. The rescued civilians are now in your care. Escort them to the rendezvous point in the northern ruins. Destroy any Trade Federation forces that threaten your mission. Having liberated a batch of prisoners, Gavin escorts them along the river. Their destination is a set of ruins, maybe a kilometre away as the Minoc flies. The boat convoy crosses under a bridge, arriving at a new village. It looks like quite a nice place to live, until the feds arrived. Just as our heroes come into view, Federation bombers demolish a large bell tower. The convoy turns to retreat, but the river is swiftly blocked. A pair of bombers fly over the bridge, knocking it into the water. We're trapped! Gavin and the escaped prisoners are trapped in a small harbour. There are droid starfighters and bombers flying over the area. By far the greatest threat to the paddle steamers are tanks. The supply seems to be endless, with more entering the level as fast as you can destroy them. Your air support notices the droid army is coming through a tunnel which can be demolished. Lobbing a couple of mortar shells is enough to cut off the AAT convoy. Okay Chang, fire the remaining two. With only a finite number of tanks, they are still a serious threat. Several of them take up position to fire on the houseboat convoy. Gavin would like to ditch the Federation gunboat. The paddle steamers are trying to reach a nearby security hangar, and so is the player. Right, I've spotted a security hangar. They have another vehicle. You can beat your boat nearby. At this point, the level switches to an N1. The moment he gets back into a cockpit, our hero abandons the people he was supposed to protect. At least, he does if he's planned ahead. There is a tank ambush in the canyon, and it takes far too much time to destroy after the fact. Using the same hangar, the civilians have transferred from boats into flash speeders. They can make it along the path to the ruins without needing too much help. Destroying the AAT ambush is the most important. The only other threats are droid starfighters, which aren't too dangerous. Eventually, the speeders make their way through the mountain pass and into the ruins. Lieutenant Sykes uses a bolt from the N1 to trigger a rockfall. An AAT turns away from the pass at the last second. However, dumping a magazine of bunker buster shells should be able to clear that. I'm not one to judge, but... An N1 starfighter arrives, bringing news of the other civilians. There had been a Trade Federation ambush, and it didn't go well. The Naboo pilots had split up. This one had lost track of the hut transports. At least one had been shot down, the squadron leader. Gavin Sykes lands his N1 and takes one of the flash speeders he'd protected. I'm sorry, sir. Don't worry, Hollis. I'm sure the captain survived. Let's find him before the Trade Federation does. Captain Kale has disappeared. Locate his downed starfighter and protect it at all costs. The Trade Federation must not be allowed to capture Captain Kale. So far, this entire game has been spent taking orders from Captain Kale. He seems like a pretty good bloke, so let's find out where he went. This area is full of stone statues, like the Gungan Sacred Place. Trade Federation forces are fairly light, mostly snap troopers and the odd bomber. The most interesting opponents are a pair of AATs on a rock bridge. Shortly after crossing it, Gavin detects a hut ship. It was taking off from a small mining base. I'm picking up something strange. Is that Borvo's ship? Federation tanks are laying siege to the place, but the Flash can do well by getting in behind. <laughs> go, no, go behind. <laughs> After the last tank is cleared, the mining facility insists the operation is entirely legal. Who's in charge here? Back off! This is a legal operation! As you know, our blockade is perfectly legal. Where's Captain Kale? This base is programmed to defend itself! This is your last warning! Not until I get some answers. 
Gavin isn't having a bar of it, wiping out the turrets and a series of transports. Their design looks rather like the hut ship, suggesting this is Borvo's mine. One of the N1 pilots reports in, having located their crashed leader. I've located the Captain Starfighter. It, it doesn't look good. Our hero detects a heavy Federation presence, many bombers and tanks. They will have to be eliminated. Kale must not be captured. That's one of our mission objectives. Eventually, we come across the wreckage of an N1 starfighter. Captain Kale is still alive, though barely. He confirms what we'd started to suspect. The, the huts are gangsters. gangsters. Borvo never intended to help free the planet. Without contributing many of his own resources, the hut has three transports full of prisoners. This is probably a worse fate than staying with the Nemoidians. Captain Kale! Are you alright, sir? Thanks. The hut betrayed us. And the rescued prisoners? He'll use them as slaves. Rescue them. Good luck. Oh. Borvo has betrayed you. He has killed Captain Kale, and now plans to sell your people into slavery. Pursue the hut, and rescue the captive civilians. Protecting the Naboo is your primary objective. By mission 11, you've just about had enough of this slimy hut. It's time to strangle the gangster and take all his slaves. Lieutenant Sykes has tracked Borvo's ship to this location. Sykes, we've spotted the hut, heading toward Porto Hill. Conspicuous numbers of hut fighters are another subtle clue. While I'm sure their fighters are useful enough, the N1 seems far superior. The first area is very much like the swamplands of mission 3. This time the shoe is on the other hoof. Gavin is not the defender. He has a lot of skill and experience, plus what is probably the better vehicle. Borvo the Hutt is trying to defeat Gavin through weight of numbers. We've seen how that worked out for the Federation and the Empire. After the first basin is cleansed, one more Hutt fighter flies out. Get your fire! Cole Cotha, stay out of my way! This one is Cole Cotha, a henchman we've dealt with a lot. He's far more familiar to us than the Hutt himself, and he wants to defect. Even outside the civilized parts of the galaxy, people don't like slavers. I'm no slaver. All right. If you're really interested in helping us, lead me to the hut. Cole will be thinking about the future after the Federation leaves. Maybe he can set up shop, take over Borvo's operation. True to his word, Cole leads you directly to the hut. He won't be participating in the battle, which is for the best. This way, you don't have to keep track of the one friendly hut fighter. Sykes, you've survived. Cut the chatter, Adela. The hut's going to pay for his crimes. Borvo's ship is hiding in what looks like a volcano crater. The slimy hut suggests Gavin join him to rule the galaxy as fighter and slug. Borvo likes your spirit, Sykes. He offers you a place at his side. I don't take bribes. Now sit down. Our hero's loyalty is not for sale, so the ploy doesn't succeed. Shortly after the fight begins, N1 reinforcements arrive. They've run out of proton torpedoes, so the player will have to handle Borvo alone. For this part, it really helps to have a full rack of your own torpedoes. You can handle the fight with just laser cannons, but it's harder than it needs to be. Aiming is also difficult. For some reason, your N1 will nose down during an attack run. That brings your laser cannons off target, and can cause missiles to become missiles. It takes a while to whittle down the hut's shielding, no matter what weapons you have. The ship jettisons the entire rear section, leaving the command module as a large escape craft. We lost something. Not to worry, we are still flying half a ship. Borvo has survived and will live on in Nal Hutter. You saved your people and Borvo's limping back to Nal Hutter. Well, we won't be seeing him again. <laughs> now what, Lieutenant? We get back to the Trade Federation. But I don't know how or where yet. And we're still short of pilots. A few days ago, the hunt had me scout out a couple of prison camps near here. Start by liberating those, and you'll get all the pilots you need. The Trade Federation has imprisoned Naboo's most important leaders in the notorious Camp 4. Reach the camp, take out the Trade Federation forces, and free the captives before reinforcements can arrive. The next mission has a clear reference to dialogue from the movie. And we have information that Camp 4 lies somewhere north of this valley. When the queen is being escorted out of her own palace, she is sent for processing. Commander. Yes, sir. Process them. 
Captain, take them to Camp 4. Roger, roger. The battle droid sent her to Camp 4, but we never see any camps in the movie. Games are particularly good at letting you explore places we've only heard about. The search for Camp 4 starts in a region with extremely tall hills. Cole confirms the location of the very important prison. The first place to search is down a side passage. One of your wingmen spots a Federation base inside, so he sets his throttle to Leroy Jenkins. My family could be in that camp. I'm going in. Hollis, stay in formation! You lose 50 DKP again for not being where the fuck you were supposed to be. The rest of us are obliged to follow and attack this installation. I can't chance it. I'm going in to attack the base. Okay, Joe. You're the expert. There's nothing significant here, just a lot of droid starfighters and a landing ship. While Gavin fights off the turrets, a C-9979 landing barge takes off. While the Resistance may be able to destroy a lander, it wouldn't really hinder the feds. There are other priorities, such as droid starfighters attacking the farmhouses. Once the planes are secure, the N-1 pilots try flying into another valley. This one has a river with a couple of gunboats, which are generally inconsequential. There's no point destroying them unless you're into that defending the citizens stuff. After all, there's more to a game than its mechanics. We are going to save as many of our own as possible. Why, some might ask? We'd never need an excuse to save our own, but... The most revealing decisions are the ones the game doesn't recognize. A strategy game may not care about casualties, but the player can choose to. That's also the basis of challenges, like the various Iron Man modes. Speedrunning may prioritize time, but it could also track number of jumps. At the end of this valley, Gavin comes across a lake. It's not a lake. It's an ocean. Possibly a sea. Either way, there are gunboats on the water. These can be mostly ignored once again. The real objective is to capture a hangar on the shore. This means all droid starfighters are gone and the turrets are blown off. Lieutenant Sykes takes a heavy stab from the hangar, which allows him to slip past the energy fence outside Camp 4. They must be using the transports to move prisoners around the planet. Then the transports will lead straight into the prison camp. Why this disguise might possibly work is confusing. A little short for meat bag. Huh? Oh, the uniform. Single trooper aerial platforms are completely open. There isn't so much as a windscreen. It's obvious there's a human riding the speeder instead of a droid. Sure enough, your disguise fails as soon as you pass the gate. Halt. Where are your prisoners? More H-steps swarm in to attack, which should be easy to handle. To progress, you must ride up a ramp to the upper level. If you weren't looking for it, it can be hard to even spot the route. There's a tank heading down the ramp as Gavin rides up, easily evaded. Once you reach the higher level, there is another tank, plus multiple turrets. This part of the mission shows the process of breaking a prison camp. First, reduce the defenses to a level you can survive. Next, look for a weak point or shield generator. Once the power screen has been disabled, you can carefully drive inside the walls. You'll find a prison block with a particular purple door. Blasting that a few times will blow a hole through it, freeing the prisoners. Stand back. The main part of Camp 4 is at a higher altitude, up the next hill. As soon as you go through the gates, there's a hangar directly ahead. This is the first time you gain access to the giant speeder, which Gavin will use as a preferred land speeder on all surface missions. The process of breaking open a prison remains the same. There is no apparent shield generator, but if you look carefully, there are crates stacked up by a wall. Perhaps there were spare tank shells in them, because they're quite volatile. With only a few blaster bolts, they demolish the outer wall. Gaffin gains access to the cells on one side, which happens to be the same bailey as the fence power generator. Knocking that out takes down the opposite fence, letting you free another set of captives. To actually escape from this place, you need to climb up another hill. There are a pair of generators on top, but the land speeder controls make it hard to survive. If you fail to break in time, your speeder will sail over the edge. Regardless of your remaining health, that instantly destroys your vehicle. All your prisoners climb into some conveniently placed civilian speeders. With the energy fence deactivated, everyone proceeds forward to the next area. This is the final part of Camp 4. It's a far tougher nut to crack. There is no convenient stack of crates. You're expected to wait for an N1 pilot to fly in, blasting a large fuel tank from the sky. 
This knocks a hole into the wall, so Gavin can make for the nearest ramp. The final energy fence is powered by generators at the top of the next hill. From this point, it's a simple run down the hill and away from Camp 4. Best not to wait for droid reinforcements. A well-armoured land speeder. The GN speeder is used chiefly for crowd control and other non-combat situations. Although fairly slow, the GN speeder is sturdy and reliable. In most land speeder levels, you have up to three options. The flash speeder is the baseline, the point of comparison. Heavy snap is even less appealing. What you really want is the purple kind. I've never been sure how to pronounce this name. That doesn't matter, as long as I'm reading books or typing. I chose giant earlier, entirely for the sake of a pun with giant. <laughs> Battle for Naboo has a voice description of the vehicle. The Gian Speeder. The Gian Speeder. Gian is what the voice actor says, and I believe it's consistent with other material. This sort of evidence is very weak. The game could just be wrong. I've heard Tantive 4 turn up in official media as Tantivi 4. However you pronounce it, the Giant is usually your best land speeder. Unlike every other vehicle in the game, the Giant has unlimited ammo for its secondary weapon. <laughs> yeah, boy. The main button controls the blasters at the sides, firing green bolts. Instead of concussion missiles or proton torpedoes, alt fire is just a red laser. That's often convenient. Most vehicles run dry within seconds. The damage output is more consistent. Aiming even follows the same path. The game also allows you to charge a shot from the laser cannon. Treating it as rapid fire, it takes six red bolts to kill an AAT. If you hold down the trigger for a few seconds, one charged bolt will destroy a tank. Giants are a nice upgrade from the flash speeder, in almost all cases. Captain Panaka and the Queen have returned to Naboo. Rendezvous with Panaka and follow him to the Queen, where you'll learn Amidala's grand plan for freeing Naboo. Mission 13 is where the movie starts to come back in. The previous dozen levels took place over the course of a few days, while the Queen was gone. Now Panaka has returned, and it's time to retake the planet. All officers receiving this transmission are ordered to meet at Reska Hill. Panaka? Maybe he can get us organized. The last mission took place at night, the breaking of Camp 4. Mission 13 starts at sunrise the next morning. Captain Panaka gets attacked as soon as he broadcasts a message. A swarm of stamp troopers descend upon a village, supported by droid starfighters. Panaka survives thanks to the Naboo resistance. They park their speeders and get everyone up to speed on the plan. What's the plan? Gavin is assigned to guard the city's rear entrance. As it happens, that was exactly the right call. A Trade Federation convoy is moving through precisely the route we're meant to guard. To make matters worse, a stone column collapses behind the last AAT. There's no way to pursue, we'll have to take the long way. This works out fairly well, as the RSF are under attack elsewhere. A woman called Palmer is cornered at the end of the gorge. Let's head aside. This is Palmer on the southern ridge. We're picking up Trade Federation forces moving our way, fast! There are two droid bombers and two tanks, attacking an isolated hangar. Those are generally a good sign. This mission introduces a Naboo bomber, the slowest aircraft in the game. Even with the additional firepower of a bomber, there's no way of blasting through MTT hulls. The convoy would arrive before it could be whittled down, and that's assuming the bomber survived. I'm most impressed by all the precautions taken, Captain. However, I'll be happier when we reach our destination. Panaka directs you to take out an airbase, which is fairly easy. You can spare a bomb or two. After that, the convoy would pass through Widow's Valley. The objective is to slow down the droid army, so it's time to put those pillars to use. Knocking them into the path should delay the convoy's movement. Panaka has a demolition team carrying thermal detonators. They arrive from the far end of the valley, setting up on a bridge. This is a great idea. It's the perfect way to thwart a convoy of indestructible foes. Those MTTs and AATs are land speeders, not air speeders. Their hover sailing won't be more than a few meters, so they could never cross a gap like this. Quick, we've got to get across. Find the controls and extend the bridge. I think I just blasted it. 
If you've delayed the droid army by enough, you can set off the detonators with a bomb. The bridge collapses and the day is saved. Four additional MTTs might have been enough to turn the tide of battle. But good work, Lieutenant. If that convoy had reached the city, we'd be finished. We have a speeder waiting for you at the south gate. Meet us there. A prototype vehicle, seldom used by the RSF, the Naboo bomber combines deadly Nubian technology with Naboo space frame design. The heavily armored vehicle carries devastating energy bombs for air-to-ground combat, while standard laser cannons allow the pilot to engage airborne threats. A rare sight in the skies above Naboo, the bomber is nonetheless an important component in the Naboo's fight against the Trade Federation. Late in the game, we unlock another variant of the N1, a Naboo bomber considerably larger than the original fighter. It has three times the wingspan and over twice as many engines. Nobody will be surprised to hear that this bomber uses Nubian hardware. By ordering the critical components from a catalogue, Naboo gets freedom. They can build any kind of space frame they like, so long as they leave room for the parts. Room doesn't seem to be a problem for this prototype bomber. Instead of a canopy that slides open, this has fixed cockpit windows. There also seems to be a door in the side of the ship hull. That implies a considerably larger plane, not single occupant. It looks like there's room for two seats side by side, not to mention the cabin. I'd estimate a crew from one to five men. We're on your tail, General Kenobi. Set his foils in attack position. Bombers require one thing above all, the bombs. In this case, we find devastating energy bombs. Those aren't a traditional Naboo weapon, in fact quite the opposite. The last place we saw such a thing was on droid starfighters. Instead of proton torpedoes, vultures have energy torps. We expect these to use similar technology to a blaster, just with unusual trade-offs. For the bomber variant of the droids, we assume a very similar weapon. Like with blaster cannons, ammunition is generally not a concern. By the time you use all the blaster gas, you'll be out of fuel as well. The Naboo bomber is not treated as having bottomless bomb bays. That would normally imply we have physical projectiles carried aboard. Most levels are based around having a limited set of torpedoes and missiles. We're out of rockets, sir. Uniquely, the bomber slowly regenerates its ammunition. If your bomb bay is ever full, you're wasting potential damage. Besides the energy bombs, the Naboo bomber has a set of laser cannons. These are some of the most powerful in the game, with a slower rate of fire. Looking at the shape of the hull, very little is identical to the N1. At the back of the main body, you have a small thruster. The next set of engines outward are the largest on the ship. These don't quite match any of the designs used by existing Naboo ships. As production changes to a different vehicle, they just select different engines from the parts catalogue. Out at the wingtips are engines 4 and 5. These are relatively tiny, perhaps they are reused from the N1. The bomber probably started as a twin-engine design. The Queen plans to intercede in a bold attempt to capture Newt Gunray. You must create a diversion to distract the Trade Federation's forces guarding Thede. Once Panaka and Amadala are within the city limits, travel to the Thede hangar and join the attack. Mission 14 is entirely based on a few seconds of movie footage. We know that Panaka and the Resistance created a diversion. Once we get to the main entrance, Captain Panaka will create a diversion. We open with Gavin driving a giant speeder into the city. It plays like the very first level, Escape from Thede. Navigation is more of a challenge than the droids for most of the level. As you wind your way through the streets, you spot two Federation gunboats patrolling the river. They pose much less of a threat than a tank or droidica. On the other hand, blowing them up would be distracting. Once Gavin passes the river, Palmer reports in. Apparently, her forces have been backed into a corner, again. The security forces converge on her location, with at least one other giant speeder getting in ahead. Together, they are able to destroy a pair of tanks and several droidicas. Assuming you manage to save anyone, Palmer joins you in a flash speeder. That was close. We see yet another speeder design, this one a large personnel carrier. Now everyone follow me to Kelsey Plaza. It contains a set of Naboo commandos, who are dressed like security officers. There is a short escort mission, but the plaza is quite safe. The most dangerous enemies are destroyer droids, no starfighters or tanks. It's only a matter of defending the commandos as they demolish the gate. Mission 
Once through the shattered gate, we cross back into movie territory. As you know, Panaka waves through a giant speeder to move through the arch. You get to play that speeder, taking that first shot. If we assume that this game is canon, one of these guys is named Gavin. Panaka motions you to slow right down and stop. You are expected to take the shot exactly as ordered. Prepare to fire. Aim just below the main turret. Make your first shot count. Ready, fire! Right on time. In fact, dead on time. When you've cleaned out the tanks, the game shows a different angle of the hangar launch from the movie. Bravo Flight has been ordered to destroy the mammoth droid control ship in orbit around Naboo. You must target the starship's weakest areas. The first thing I'd like to say is that this mission briefing tells us the plan. It highlights specific weak points on the droid control ship. Use your N1 to disable the control ship's tractor beams and shield generators. Inside the final mission, it begins with a surprisingly perfect cutscene. Exactly like in the movie, the N1 squadron leaves the planet. We see a close-up of the control ship launching its flock of vultures. The next part is done in gameplay. Enemy fighters straight ahead. Enemy fighters straight ahead! The droids appear in just the right formation. It's flawless. For this part of the mission, the droid control ship is part of the star field. A bit of background decoration, just like the planet below. Once a sufficient number of vultures have been slain, Bravo Squadron flies closer. They're counting on us down there. We must take out that droid control ship. Look at the size of that thing! A tractor's nabbed me. I need some help here. I can't escape. A little too close. One fighter passes too close to the open ends of the cargo bay. That brings back memories of the Death Star, but it also rings true. We're caught in a tractor uh -huh. and it's pulling us in. There's gotta be something you can do. If you remember the Cross Sections book, there are tractor beams installed there. One tractor emitter is destroyed in a cutscene. The next three, you are expected to take out on your own. Shortly after knocking out the tractors, a pilot reports in. He just saw an N1 fly into the main hangar of the Luka Hulk. This choice is very neat. It ties the game to the movie. The open hangars used to have defenses, but Bravo Squadron got rid of the tractor beams. Bravo Leader, one of our fighters just flew into the hangar. I copy. Buy him some time to escape. Anakin could only fly inside because the ship had been damaged. Bravo Leader suggests nobody else get any fancy ideas. And nobody else try that stunt! Our next objective is on the dorsal surface, so it makes sense to knock out the quad lasers. <laughs> Episode 1 established shields as being a problem. However, there's great risk. The weapons on your fighters may not penetrate the shields. Luckily, Episode 6 had already given us a solution. You can just shoot at the shield generator, through the shields. Sir, we've lost our bridge deflector shields. For how this might work, I like the system from FTL called an FTL. Shields have multiple layers and each bolt may only take down one layer. Shields slowly regenerate, so it's possible to be immune to weak opponents. It's also possible to fire a whole volley and only do a single point of damage. Take out the shield generators. When the objective changed to shield generator, I was filled with doubt. I know exactly where to find that component, but did the game? As a matter of fact, it does know. The target turned out to be exactly where I expected. Behind the center sphere, on the dorsal side of the connecting arm. On my first attempt at this mission, I carefully distributed my shots. There are actually two layers here, four of the antenna farm. There is a small lip or shelf running around the edge. Half my torpedoes went above the belt, and half below. This game isn't exactly right about the location of the shield. The placement is correct, but the hitbox is slightly off. Its shield generator is the lower of the two layers. The top one is actually the shield projector. It makes perfect sense that the projector would be closer to the surface. Since both parts are essential, either one should be a valid target. Come to think of it, that perfectly sums up the game. Battle for Naboo isn't perfect. But it is surprisingly good. So I make a fine addition to my collection. Accurate enough that a fan should have few to no complaints. A worthy addition to the universe, so long as you don't mind flash missile tubes.
Eventually, after exhausting every torpedo in his N1, Gavin Sykes does it. A final pair of blaster bolts hit the shield projector, obliterating the machinery. The droid control ship is not crippled, but it is exposed. Bravo Squadron prepares another attack run, perhaps aiming for the engines or the bridge. All of this coincides with Anakin hitting the pilot reactors from within. Oops. The Luka Hulk starts exploding from the inside, and little Annie flies out. Luke, what about? Out of the main hole! You will note the absence of a particular line. It's blowing up from the inside! We didn't hit it! Rick doesn't say, we didn't hit it, because we certainly did. Amazing effort, everyone! This is Captain Panaka to Bravo Flight. Great work, crew. The Trade Federation Army is out of commission. Naboo is finally free. The battle for Naboo is over. Though many people deserve credit, we can say one man did more than most. The Gordon Freeman of the Royal Security Forces. Make contact, Sykes. Then lend a hand. His name is Lieutenant Gavin Sykes, and he is you. Through your skill as a pilot, you won the war a dozen times. With a little help from your friends. Naboo erupts into celebration, which involves copious fireworks. As in the movie, many N1s fly over Theed. In the game, that includes a Naboo bomber and multiple police cruisers. I approve of this. All the individual aircraft are solid designs. Battle for Naboo is an example of a proper Star Wars game. The campaign tells an entertaining story of fighter pilots and freedom. None of the movie's main characters are involved, except for Panaka. It's a side story. Several things can happen at the same time. If Kale went down, we're going to locate him. Games offer another perspective, a window into the same galaxy. There are no significant changes or lore contradictions. New vehicles have been added, but they're of good quality. Mechanically, the game is not terribly difficult. Instead of adding more tanks, the player is expected to change his goals. Challenge yourself by using a suboptimal ship. Look into the medal system, which encourages more skillful aim. Thanks for your help, Sykes. I don't know how much longer we could have. This is Captain Panaka of the Royal Security Forces on the RSF emergency frequency. All officers receiving this transmission are ordered to meet at risk. That's it for this video. Thanks for sticking around until the very end. We're trying to get each new part out at the same time every week. It'd pay to make sure you've got notifications turned on, so you'll know as soon as that happens. There are two ways to support us. Become a patron at patreon.com slash thebreadcircus, or subscribe, like, and comment. Only the former option guarantees that your name lives on in history. The other is embarrassing youtube stuff. Brandon Smith is clearly using a pseudonym. Das Lol Tractor has a Lamborghini tractor he wants us to know about. John Back, a Corolla pilot and a good friend. Kamikaze Velociraptor, the worst kind of lizard. Might also be a girl. Conk, the only thing worse than a Discord moderator. An Australian. Losba Evoli couldn't be bribed to draw Absol, whatever that is. Lieutenant Dan's legs, the only thing worse than a Star Wars nerd, is an aviation nerd. The little Annie of combined arms warfare. Mountain Eagle, our second favourite Norwegian. And Zafrax, who gave us a whole bunch of money and then disappeared. 
What, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? I'm a Toydarian! My tricks don't work on me, only money. No money, no parts, no deal. <laughs>